From this year's Nobel Literature Laureate to Mo Digliani's iconic portraits to an epic cinematic collection that's all coming up on today's show, we begin with the writer praised for expressing the unsayable. Norwegian author and playwright Jan Fossa was awarded this year's Nobel Prize for Literature. His prolific body of work includes more than 40 plays and his magnum opus Septology, a multi-volume novel written as a single sentence. Siobhan Silk tells us more more about him. As the master of spare writing, it was only fitting that Jun Foss's reaction to winning the Nobel Prize for Literature would be understated. I stand here and feel a little numb, but of course very happy for the great honour. I have been involved in the discussion about the Nobel Prize for 10 years, I think. I'm used to the excitement around it, but I'm used to not getting it. That I got it this year was unexpected. When he learned the news, he was in Norway's western fjords. That's where he grew up, a landscape that's a recurring motif in his huge body of work. He's completed dozens of novels, essays, poems, children's books and plays, and he's one of the most performed contemporary European playwrights. Writing is a way of life. I started when I was 12, and now I'm 64. I've been writing for many years and more. It's something I need. If I don't write, I don't know what to do. Fosse traces his birth as an artist to an almost fatal childhood accident. In his work, he explores themes of loss, solitude, faith and existential questions of birth and death. He reduces language and everything just to a few, few words. You know, the motivation was also for his... You know, his, his ability to give voice to the unsayable. Those things that are very difficult to talk about, but he talks about it and he writes about it. Fossa has said that his act of writing is a gift that he's been given by something or someone unknown. And when he writes, he's putting down something that's already written before it disappears. Next, to one of Europe's most celebrated painters. Here in Paris, a new exhibition zooms in on work from the last two months of Vincent van Gogh's life. He spent that brief period in the French village of auvers sur oise northwest of Paris, and it was one of his most extraordinary before his premature death at the age of 37. Emerald Maxwell tells us more. This auberge in auvers sur oise is where Vincent van Gogh spent his final days. And this is one of his depictions of the French village north of Paris. Although the painter spent only a little over two months there, the period was one of his most productive and is now the subject of an exhibition at Paris's Musée d'Orsay. There was an urgency uh, this in those last two months uh, to say what he had to say, what he felt he had to say, he had to produce through his painting, of course. And there's a burst of life in particularly those paintings. After a stint in a psychiatric hospital, Vincent van Gogh followed his doctor's orders and threw himself into his work. Over 72 days in Auvergne, he churned out an average of a painting a day and 33 drawings. But it wasn't just quantity. Van Gogh also produced some of his greatest masterpieces during this time. The periods of madness were when he could no longer paint, when he was really too stressed. He created these incredible compositions with the stress of knowing that maybe in a week's time he wouldn't be able to paint any more. The exhibit includes Tree Roots, thought to be Van Gogh's last painting. It's dated July 27, 1890, the same day that the artist shot himself in the chest. He really fought to the end to paint exceptional things. These paintings do not show resignation or a moment when he lacked inspiration or wanted to give up. On the contrary, he's trying to renew things on a daily basis. Vincent van Gogh cut short his life at just 37 years. He is buried in Auvergne beside his brother, Theodore. 
Well, Van Gogh died over a century before Pokemon gained popularity, but the Dutch painter was a fan of Japanese prints. That's why the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam has teamed up with the Japanese franchise to mark its 50th anniversary. Pokemon characters like Pikachu and Eevee, who you see there, have invaded the museum from now until January 7th. They feature in paintings inspired by Van Gogh's masterpieces and created by Japanese artists and Pokemon illustrators, like this Pikachu version of Van Gogh's self-portrait with gray felt hat by Naoyo Kimura. Well, another painter who died long before his time was Modigliani. The Italian artist had a turbulent life and died in a state of poverty in 1920 at just 35 years old. Modigliani and his iconic elongated portraits are the subject of a new exhibition at the Orangerie Museum here in Paris. Inca Oyatare tells us more about his distinctive style. He drew his subjects with an oval-shaped face, almond eyes, and the long nose. This was Mogdigliani's ideal woman. An elongated head coupled with a slightly tilted neck would become the artist's trademark style. Amadeo Mogdigliani was born in Italy and later settled in Paris in 1906. It was at the Louvre that he discovered the abstract form of African art. Spot the difference here between this mask and Mogdigliani's woman with a velvet ribbon. He was heavily influenced by Africa and his native Italy. From the masters of the Renaissance, Modigliani adopted the blank gaze. The era also inspired him to portray his subjects as if they were slightly frozen in time. While he painted from many historical influences, Modigliani's works were imbued with modernity. He was a rebel, nicknamed Modi, upon on Modi, the French word for cursed, the artist led a rock and roll lifestyle. And drugs and rock and roll. He was a revolutionary in his work too. He was the first artist to paint eyes without pupils. We can see that the slender almond-shaped eyes here are not identical. One eye is slightly lighter than the other. The artist painted people with many different facets, but he portrayed them with these slight contradictions, these slight nuances. While one eye observes the world, the other looks inward into the soul. This level of intimacy was commonplace in Modigliani's depiction of his subjects that have become icons of modern art. Next, we bring you the story of two French brothers who are so passionate about film that you might mistake their house for a museum. Their vast collection of memorabilia is really a sight to behold, most of it obtained through donations, though the brothers also go to auctions to hunt for new treasures. Charlie James has the story. In the history of movies, the Lumiere brothers are credited with inventing cinema. Now meet the Lupo brothers. Hervé, François. For over 40 years, these twins have been collecting all sorts of objects related to filmmaking, costumes, lighting, projectors, and cameras, of course. One of the cameras from Star Wars, 1977. Over there, a Charlie Chaplin camera. And then here, a projector from the start of cinema from 1896. Visiting their house in Burgundy is like rewinding the story of cinema. This 300-kilogram camera is a heavyweight in French cinema. It was used to film several classic movies. There are iconic objects and others that are more unfamiliar. This device is a mutoscope. This one is from 1920. After cinema was invented, why did they continue to make them? Simply because they thought film was a passing fad. In total, they have over 22,000 pieces, and some are more precious than others. Like the Palme d'Or from the very first Cannes Film Festival in 1939, which was canceled because of the war. This is the Holy Grail. Even now in their 60s, the search for that rare gem never stops. We'll stop looking when we're in the stars. Not Hollywood stars, but the ones up there. The brothers have worked in cinema for a long time, but before completely dedicating themselves to their collection, they would like to open it up to the public. Our goal is to not keep everything in boxes. We put on traveling exhibitions, and we would like to keep doing that. We also work on films that need antique equipment as props. We would like to have a big space dedicated to cinema. 
but the project is struggling to take off. So for the moment, the incredible collection is stuck in boxes, a museum without visitors, waiting for the next step to shine light on this unique legacy. And finally, we end with the return of Omar Sy as France's most wanted and most charming gentleman thief in the latest installment of Lupin. The Netflix series stars Sy as Hassan Diop, a son of Senegalese immigrants who, after the wrongful death of his father, turns to a life of elegant crime inspired by the mystery novels of Maurice Leblanc and his hero, Arsène Lupin. The show was the first French production to make it to the number one slot on Netflix. Season three came out this week. We'll leave you with a peek at it. It. Thank you so much for watching. For more culture news, you can always head to our website. The news is coming up on France 24 after this. Je vais, le, je vais le recoller, vous avez du, de la colle forte Je suis assez adroit, ça se verra pas. Versailles.